The people today, they call you king. They think you are a messiah. But you seem to ignore them. Now she's going to be our king. Who do you think I am? Son of God. You can't have known this by what you know of me, Peter. It has been revealed to you by God. <coughs> Good afternoon. I am Brother Esquire and I would like to welcome you to this edition of Your Moment for Biblical Truth. What we just saw actually has a lot to do with the lesson that we're going to be preaching today. And today what I want to do is I want to touch on a question that a lot of Islamic people ask me. And that is, do I have to die so that you can be forgiven of your sins against me? Or do I have to die so that God can forgive you? This is a question that they really ask. So, without further ado, what I want to do is I want to go ahead and get into this subject. Now, when I talk to a lot of Islamic people about Jesus coming into the world and shedding his blood and giving his life a sacrifice for sin, I find that a lot of them usually ask the same question. Which is really not a question, but it's more of a statement. And the conversation usually goes like this. I tell them that Jesus shed his blood and died so that we can be forgiven of God. Then they say, that makes no sense. Because what you are saying in effect is that in order for God to truly forgive you when you sin against me, I have to die. Or, in order for me to truly forgive you when you sin against me, I have to die. This is crazy. In order, I'm sorry, if God or myself wants to forgive you of your sin, why can't we just do it? If I want to forgive you, then I can just do that. I don't have to die to forgive you. <clears throat> now, The problem with this is, first of all, you are not God. So you can only forgive the action against you. And you or no one else has to die for this to happen. And second, you misunderstand the power and the blood of Jesus. And therefore, the death of Jesus is too hard to understand. Not to mention the fact that you are playing Messiah to say that you are the one who has to die to forgive sin. And that in itself is a blasphemous way of thinking. First of all, when you forgive someone of a sin against you, you are only forgiving them of what they did against you on a personal level. You cannot forgive them of the sin that they have committed against God by breaking his law. Only God himself can do this. Now, when you forgive them of what they did against you, what you are doing is releasing them from the grip of confusion and anger and mistrust. What you are saying is, I don't hold it against you and you can still come to me and receive of my love and of the love of God through me to you. And it is our prayer that God forgives you. But only you and ask God for his forgiveness. My forgiveness of you has no effect on God forgiving your sin. What happens is when you forgive someone and ask God to forgive them also, what God does is forgive them of their trespass against you, but the sin that they have did against him and his laws remain. Now, 
when it comes to God and his forgiveness, it is a little different. Because God is the judge, the jury, and the executioner. You see, when you sin against God, there is a punishment for that. It does not matter what the punishment is. What matters is there will be a reckoning for your sin. However, through ambitious prayer, the punishment can be stayed or delayed, but only until the third or fourth generations of your offspring descendants. And this is because around about the third or fourth generation of your offspring descendants, your descendants start to forget the repetitive things you did for God, and they start to turn from God, and they forget God, and the punishment that was stayed or delayed finally falls from God. And this has nothing to do with the original decree of death upon men for the original sin. This is punishment by law. But, by the sacrifices of the blood, will sin be washed away to truly be forgiven, truly removed from the one who sinned against God to not be remembered upon him or any of his generations. His sin will be forgiven and removed from him. Far east is from west. Highest mountain from the deepest sea. His sin is removed, never to be remembered. God himself will forget the sin. Never to hold it against him. It's gone. Erased. Now, with the blood of animals, goats and calves and bulls, with the blood of those animals, it can only do this for past sins. And with this, it forced the people to go up every year to the temple to receive this washing away of sins. It is important to keep that fact in mind. That they had to go up every year to receive the washing away of sins. Which means their sins for the past year will be washed away. But the moment they finish their sacrifice and walk out that temple and look at someone and say, Wow, I wouldn't mind getting up in that woman right there. That is another sin that is held against them at that moment. It is a new sin that those animals' blood did not and cannot wash away. He must wait until the next time to wash away those sins. Now, as Islamic people who believe the Quran and the scriptures in it concerning Jesus to be true, you believe that Mary is the mother of Jesus, and so do we Christians. You believe that Mary was a virgin when she gave birth to Jesus. So do we Christians. You believe that there is no doubt that Joseph is not and cannot be the biological father of Jesus. And we Christians believe this too. So, if you as an Islamic person truly believe this, then answer one question for me. Where did Jesus get his blood? Where did Jesus get his blood? Because what I'm thinking is, we're saying he's born of a virgin, but we are downplaying what that means to be born of a virgin. It has been downplayed. The Virgin Mary. We run over that. Let me tell you something. I'm not trying to give her more glory than what God says she should have in that she should be remembered. Thank her. Bless her. But let's not get past that virgin birth. That is something that must be touched upon. We're running over it too fast. But we're not going to run over it too fast right now. We're going to slow it down. Now, where did Jesus get his blood from? Well, 
according to science, an embryo cannot form in a woman's womb without the sperm of the man. And without the genetic material that is contained in the sperm, the embryo will not only be unable to form because it will lack the catalyst needed to start the egg to gestate, but without the genetic material presented by the sperm from the father, the fetus in the woman's womb will never be able to form blood. Now, what you cannot do what you cannot do, what you can not do, is say that the blood of the fetus comes from the mother. Because according to science, this is impossible. It is impossible. This is because the placenta that forms stops the blood from mixing between mother and fetus. The mixing of their blood could kill them both as the body tries to fight the foreign blood types because two different blood types cannot coexist in the same body. What the placenta does is takes the blood of the mother and filters in all the nutrients and things needed for the growing fetus as well as filters out all the waste produced by the fetus. The nutrient-deprived blood, along with the waste of the fetus, is sent back into the bloodstream of the mother via the placenta to be cleansed and refilled with nutrients. And this process is called the process of filtration. The mother's blood does not come into direct contact with the fetus. The fetus, from the embryonic stage, makes its own blood. I'll say that again. The fetus, that's one, from the embryonic stage, makes its own blood. That's two. The blood is produced by the embryo due to the, due to the genetic material from the father interacting with the genetic material from the mother. But this cellular level genetic material mingling cannot happen without the genetic material provided by the father. So, then, if a fetus needs both sets of genetic material from both parents to form blood and to determine the blood type like AB, AB negative, O, and the rest, then where did the baby Jesus get his blood from? And for that matter, what type of blood was it? Well, now we come to the nit, to the itty, and to the grit in the itty. You see the answer? Open your spiritual ears. But we're about to touch this. The answer. Just as the conception of Jesus should not have happened, the body of Jesus should not have lived. Because without the genetic material provided by the Father, the blood of Jesus should not have existed and the life of the body is in the blood. Whew. Man. Let's say that one more time. Just as the conception of Jesus should not have happened, the body of Jesus should not have lived. Because without a father, the blood of Jesus should not have existed. And the life of the body is in the blood. The birth of Jesus was a miracle. The birth of Jesus was a miracle. This means... God stepped into a situation and did something unnatural. This statement would also mean that everything about the body of Jesus was a miracle and unnatural from his hair to his blood. 
Although the blood of Jesus was red like I was, although the blood of Jesus flowed like I was, the blood of Jesus was nothing like I was. His blood was pure. It was free from the tainted genetic material of man. The blood of Jesus lacking the farthest set of genetic material for the lack of a better phrase just came to be. The blood of Jesus lacking the genetic material from the Father for the lack of a better phrase just came to be. The blood of Jesus is miracle blood. It is a blood that formed from a miracle. A blood that pumped inside of a miracle. And a blood that poured out from a miracle. The miracle body of Jesus. Everything about Jesus was a miracle. Virgin birth. Now. <laughs> virgin birth. We're not going to pass over this. We're going to give this the righteousness it deserves. We're going to teach it. Now. This miracle blood. Is the key. To our redemption. Back to God. Amen. It is the all in all in the process of our sanctification. Instead of the weak bloods of bulls and goats, which are dumb animals, which would only do for a little while, forcing people to come up every year to receive the washing away of sins, we now have the miracle blood of the Messiah, the Christ. We now have the blood of the anointed one. We now have the powerful blood of he who is, was, and is to come. The beginning and the end. We now have the blood of the Alpha and Omega. You think I'm lying? Look up this verse. Revelation 1 verse 8 and verses 17 and 18. Who is this person that we talking about? What did he call himself? Now... We have the pure, sinless blood of the miracle body that was led like a sheep to the slaughter. We now have the blood of the one that is, which means the blood is right at this moment, cleansing people of their sins and washing them away forever, never to be remembered upon them, redeeming them to God, making them white as snow. We now have the blood of the one that was. Which means we have the blood of, I'm sorry, which means his blood has come upon us and cleansed us from our sins that we have committed in the past. But more than this, it has removed from us the iniquities of our fathers, freeing us from the judgments and punishments of them. We, the world, everyone that Christ died for, we now have the blood of the one that is to come. Which means his blood is not only cleansing us of our sins and freed us of the iniquities of our fathers, thereby saving us from the condemnation of damnation and the righteous wrath of God, but it has sealed us in his holy righteousness. It has sanctified us in Christ unto God and has raptured us into the grace of unmerited favor of God, meaning we walk by faith. Not by sight. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute iniquity. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord will not charge sin. We now have a blood that covers our entire lifespan. Now. What I don't want to do is understand the fact that I keep calling the blood of Jesus miracle blood and the body of Jesus a miracle body. Virgin birth, 
miracle. Everything about it. I'm not finna understand that fact. Look, I keep calling it this because after all that I have said, this pure miracle blood stepped into the situation of sin, death, condemnation, and the complete separation of man from God and did something unnatural and supernatural. It became the fulfillment of the law of sin and death and the freedom from the condemnation of death that came upon all men because of the original sin. And let's pause for a second. Because right here, I have to say something. I have to say that when it comes to the original sin, a lot of pastors talk about many things that come with the sin that happened in the garden. With all the lies and all the finger pointing and all the theories about the significance of the fall of man and what it meant to God at the core of it all the original sin was disobedience man did the only thing he was told not to do and it led to lies finger pointing banishment and eventually murder now understand The blood has redeemed us from sin and death, and this is a miracle. The body took the punishment for sin and death, and this is a miracle. And this is the miracle. After all that I have said about the law of sin and 